this right here. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Suzanne Morse Moomaw, and I'm a faculty member in urban and environmental planning. Um, we are delighted that you're here um, to uh, hear from Morton Cabell. Uh, I want to just give a, before I give the formal introduction, I want to say a word about how we, I'm looking for Andrew. Is Andrew, he, he, another Andrew, that Andrew, okay, there, another Andrew. <laughs> Any other Andrews, feel free to jump in. Um, two of the most important Andrews. And there, there's another Andrew. I see another Andrew in the back. Um, so we were on our way, as we do most summers, on a study abroad program. And Andrew, right, right here, uh, landscape architecture uh, graduate student, wrote me and he said, when we're in Copenhagen, can we go to Copenhagenize? And I said, sure. And I reached out to Morton, who is here today. Um, and we, it really changed the whole focus, I think. It was our first city last summer. It changed the whole focus. Because all of a sudden, we were looking at how we could do without cars. Uh, Morton was so inspiring, the city was so inspiring, that all of a sudden, things changed for us for the rest of the trip. And so... That led to our invitation uh, to Morton to come to Charlottesville from, from Copenhagen. Um, the, our sponsors for tonight um, are the Center for Global Inquiry, as well as the Thrive Grant from the Center for Teaching Excellence, as well as Community Design Research um, Center. So we are, we are here to welcome a real, um, a real expert at this idea of bikes. One of the students, as Archer, back in, in, in the back there, I said, maybe we should take um, Morton on a bike ride. And he said quickly, he would never do it. It's too dangerous here. <laughs> so we want to we wanna take that out of the equation. Um, so part of this tonight is to welcome Morton. The second part of it is to launch a new uh, research effort called Communities Without Cars. Um, the the spe a specific part of that is who's without cars. Thinking about, while we're thinking about new buildings at the university, the redevelopment of certain spots, why are we even thinking about parking? Why aren't we thinking about multimodal transportation? And so we hope we'll be calling on some of you, but you'll be hearing more about that. That will be student led by Archer and other students, this research effort. So enough about that. Um, let me introduce Morton. I will say, because I am, uh, will be conscious of time, this will be an hour. Um, we should be finished by 6 o'clock or a few minutes after, but no more than that. And then if you have specific questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask Morton afterwards. So, Morton Cabell is the CEO of Copenhagenized Design Company and the former mayor of technical and environmental affairs in Copenhagen. He's a proud Copenhagener at heart, uh, and he's made his, his career has been built both in the public sector and private sector on, on creating and strategizing and generating uh, actions that make a real difference. He can certainly tell you some of what he did while he was mayor. Uh, he joined the, the design firm team in 2018 uh, with this idea of building cities across the world for bicycles. Bicycles that, that improve the environment, improve equity, and improve economic well-being. The triple bottom line of the bicycle. Um, he was uh, the Green, Red Green Alliance spokesman uh, in Copenhagen on traffic, climate, and urban planning. And in 2012, he became a member of the Congestion Commission. We need one of those here. Congestion Commission out on 29. And in 2015, uh, he became uh, a member of the Copenhagen uh, City and Port Development. Um, the most important thing you know, need to know, you are going to know in just a minute. He is approachable. He's knowledgeable. He's strategic. And I think what all of us learned in Copenhagen and from Morton is that it doesn't have to be this way. We can create different kinds of communities, a different, um, a different approach to transportation, parking, 
and certainly climate change. And I'll just close with this in case you've forgotten it. You know, Denmark owns Greenland. So, um, and I'm told on the best authority from the former mayor of Copenhagen that it is not for sale. With that, <laughs> let me introduce our speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, with that mountain of compliments to start, I'm not really sure where to continue, uh, except that I would say that Denmark doesn't own Greenland. The Greenlanders own Greenland. Uh, I think that would be the point, but at some point it's true that they are still part of the kingdom. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to be here in Virginia and to uh, tell over the next seven, eight hours about urban planning in Copenhagen. Being a former politician, once I've started, I'll never stop. So lock the doors. You're in it for, for the night. Um, my, as Suzanne said, my own background is in uh, politics. I used to, uh, early on to be a teacher in Copenhagen schools, but then uh, got uh, connected or got hooked up with politics and, and the whole idea of urban planning and changing uh, cities into becoming more livable, human scale. Uh, because that is basically what cities should be all about. Copenhagen Ice is a company that is uh, here, uh, that is uh, based in Copenhagen, but also has an office in Montreal and in Brussels. Uh, we are working with uh, cities all over the world in uh, learning, uh, making them, uh, advising them, I would say, in how to become human scale, using the bicycle as a main mode of transport. You can say reintroducing the bicycle as a main mode of transport. Because basically in most of our cities, the bicycle actually used to be that, and it can be that again. We do design, we do communication, we do planning. Once every year we have a master class where we gather urbanists from around the world in, two, in three days in Copenhagen and thereby uh, also exploring the possibilities of what to do in our various cities. And then every two years, we publish a list of the most bicycle-friendly cities in the world, the Copenhagen Ice Index. I'm sad to say that there isn't any U.S. cities on that list for the moment. We actually start off with every single city in the world above 600,000 inhabitants, and then we narrow it down, do some research, and end up with the 20 most bicycle-friendly cities. And the closest we get to the U.S. is Vancouver. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately... Uh, we, we still have some U.S. cities that we are missing on the list, but I hope they will be added over the next years. But even though we call ourselves the bicycle urbanists, basically this is not about the bicycle. I'm not a bicyclist. Let me repeat that. I'm not a bicyclist. I'm just a regular Copenhagen who happened to ride my bike every single day to work, back home from work, and wherever I'm going in the city. But I'm not a bicyclist. As little as anybody driving a car is probably calling themselves a carist. I'm not a bicyclist. I just happen to ride my bike because it's the easiest and best way. This is about the cities. And ever since in Jericho and Palestine, those eight, 9,000 years ago, people got the good idea of creating cities. And they took up the idea uh, in Lebanon, in Biblos, and then continued around the world in gathering into societies that we now call cities. Then the city has been the key part of human development. Today we know that a little more than half of the world's population is actually living in cities. And by the mid-century, the estimate is that it'll be two-thirds to three-quarters of the human population that, is, that are living in cities. And as such, it's the cities that we have to turn to if we have to look at the future for the human race. I mean, we see a lot of nations, they are talking and talking and talking about the world's problems, but it's actually also today in the cities that we see solutions and the cities that are starting to actually act upon the challenges that we have here. So this is all about the cities. And cities are the same. I mean, whether we talk Charlottesville or Copenhagen or Beijing or Barcelona, then the cities are populated with people who want to go from A to B, who want to go around the town, who want to go to work, at home, and so on. Populated with, with people. And that's more or less the same all over. And the needs we have are actually also the same, regardless of culture or nationality. And the, it's the streets that are the key part 
of the urban organism. And of course, that's diff difficult to say and kind of dangerous without looking for the nearest exit to say this in the School of Architecture. But so sorry, forget about the buildings. They come and they go, but it's the streets that are the key part of our urban organism. I mean, if I took a Copenhagener from 1419 and took her to Copenhagen today in 2019, she would be able to walk around the central part of Copenhagen without even noticing it. The big buildings are different, but the streets are exactly the same. I could give her an address and she would be able to find it. So the streets have for millennia been the, street, been the part of the city where we all met. That's where we meet, that's where we gossip, that's where we do our trading, that's where we meet friends and family. It's basically in the streets that the kids are playing when, unfortunately, things changed and they were no longer allowed to play in the streets because the cars were supposed to be there. So what happened in the cities is the traffic planning. And if there is a traffic plan in here, I'm so sorry, I'm going to dish you for the next hour. Um, because what happened in, uh, in our cities is that traffic planning suddenly happened and became derailed and derailed also the developing of our, of development of our cities. Basically, right up until the 20s or 30s, depending on where you are in the world, then the cities would look like this. If you are on a bike or walking around like we should be as humans, then it's very easy to come from A to B. We had to accept one or two detours in public transport, but then came the car. And when we came to the 1950s, then suddenly most of our cities around the world look like that one, where it's very easy to come from A to B if you're in a car. But I was at a conference in Dundee in Scotland last year. And it's not that I don't like Scotland. I actually love being there. Uh, but getting from my hotel to my conference center seemed, turned out to be quite a hassle. If I'd only taken a taxi. We are talking 100 meters. That was just about it. That was between the hotel and the conference center. It took me 15 minutes walking there. Because every time I, went, I came to an intersection, then there was some kind of barrier and I couldn't cross the road. So I had to make a detour all around the city to make it to the conference center. If I'd only taken a car, then I'd been there in probably less than a minute. That's the way urban planning has turned our cities in most of the world today. And that's probably the, one of the worst things. And the reason for that is because the question that has been asked throughout most of the 20th century is this one. How many cars can we move down the street? And when you ask that question, then, also, then you turn to streets that look like this. Two broad car lanes where there is space enough for the cars and trucks and whatever. There you have then uh, some parking and then you have a very narrow sidewalk if you're lucky. But it's time to change the question. Because that question is so last millennium. The question that we should be asking is actually this one. How many people can we move down the street? Because in the situation where our cities are growing and where we need efficiency, then we actually need to talk about how many people we are moving, not how many metal boxes we are moving. They are not interesting. But it's people, human beings that are interesting. How many people can we move down the street? And if we start asking that question, then we'll have a street layout that looks a little bit like this, where we have uh, public transport, in this case a reserved place of, in the street for public transport. We still have a car lane. And then we have bike lane, a safe protected bike lane or bike track. And then we have space enough for the pedestrians. A street like this actually has the capacity of 10 times the capacity of the previous road you saw. 10 times. That's efficiency. That's how most of our streets should look like if we actually ask the right questions about how many people can we move around. Because then suddenly we have space enough for a lot of other things than just cars. Uh, we still need cars. There are people who need a car, people with a disability, people with a handicap, I mean, we are not going to exclude them from taking an equal part in our cities. They need to get around. That's their right as well. But the moment we get all the lazy drivers away from their cars, 
then there is actually a lot of space that can be used for those people who actually need a car or need four-wheel transport. It could also be transport, uh, you can say logistics. A lot of our, our goods still need to be transported in vans or in trucks. They will also be more efficient if we can get all the later ones away from the car and up, up on public transport or a bicycle. So we started to ask this question. And if we do so, well, it's a simple matter of, ur of urban math. This is a street in Copenhagen on a regular morning. And I don't think it's that different from the US. But the average number of people in these cars is just about 1.05. That's the average number of uh, people in a car in a on a Danish highway leading into Copenhagen. They take up a lot of space. So here you have around uh, 50, or th sorry, 30 people in the cars. You have 65 people in the bus and 51 people over there on the bike lane and one poor soul desperately trying to turn right in her car. She made it, I can't tell you. Um, but of course, she had to wait a little until all the bikes had turned right first. But it's a simple question of urban math. That if we actually make more space for the bicycles, for the lot, uh, for the majority of people who actually don't have to take up a lot of space, then we create more efficient cities, and then actually we can have space enough for a lot of other activities. So if you remember the previous chart, then this is actually how we should do modern traffic planning here in the 21st century. Make it easy to come from A to B when you're, on, when you're walking or on a bicycle. We, of course, have to accept one or two detours in public transport, transport because Obviously, it's pretty hard to make a subway to everybody's home, so that's fine. But make it as difficult as possible, at least in the urban setting, to be in your car. Then we can actually have a situation where we can create transport for the many, not for the few. Now, I'm from Copenhagen, and I know that at least half of you will say, at least you'll think by yourself, that's fine. But we are not Copenhagen. And no, you're not Copenhagen, and neither should you be. Because that would be foolish, just to copy-paste everything that Copenhagen has done. But I think we can actually learn a lot from each other in how we create our cities. And what's important is that Copenhagen 2019 isn't Copenhagen for just a few decades ago. Now, for those of you who might not know everything about Copenhagen, I don't blame you. Uh, this is North Europe. This is basically how we are situated. We are 4.2 million in what we officially call Greater Copenhagen area. That's the southern part of Sweden, don't tell Stockholm, uh, and the eastern part of Denmark. In what you could say metropolitan setting, around 2 million people. And then in the city, the municipality itself, around 620,000 people over what is just about 25 square miles. That's a quite, con quite dense city center, that's one municipality. We are 28 municipalities in Greater Copenhagen, uh, so also administra administratively a quite complex situation. But just to give you a slight example of the proportions we are talking about here. And if we jump right into it, then this is the modal share for bicycles. 49% when we talk commuting, I have to say, of all commuting leading into Copenhagen, today 49% is done on a bicycle. If we are even only talking about the 620,000 living in the city of Copenhagen itself, the number is 62%. Two thirds of us ride our bicycle every single day, year round. And 75% of those who do it on a nice summer day, we do have those in Scandinavia, although you might not think so, um, then uh, they also do that on a November or February, where it's gloomy, cold, just around the freezing point, it's wet, and you really just want to work from home. Um, there, still 75% of us ride a bicycle. That's just so you know the numbers for some of the pictures I'm going to show you in, in a few moments. This is a Copenhagen commute. Um, that's when we talk about how Copenhageners get to work in the morning or to school. 62% of us on a bicycle, 21% in public transport, 8% are walking, and that leaves 9% in a car meaning that 91% of us actually choose the active or green mobility every single day. We had a big discussion. I mean, most of Europe has the tradition that every third Sunday 
in September, uh, you have a car-free city. We had a big discussion in Copenhagen about doing that. And at one point when I was mayor, a journalist called me and said, but Morten, why is it Copenhagen City Council hasn't adopted this? Why don't we have that? And then, okay, he caught me at 6.30 in the morning. I was tired and probably should have thought twice before ask, ask, answering because I said, now, nah, you know, this year we're going to do a bike-free Monday instead. And there was silence in the phone. And then a few seconds later I said, but that'll be chaos. Imagine, uh, what, what are all those people going to do? What, what about all the cars? Where are they going to be? And then, okay, okay, this can actually go good. Uh, it can really turn out well. So I was like, yeah, that's the whole point. We'll show how the city will look like with, if we're suddenly a car-oriented city and not a bike-oriented. Then he understood it was just joking uh, because, of course, that would be chaos to imagine uh, 400,000 extra cars in Copenhagen streets on a Monday morning. The city would break down very soon. This is just a Copenhagen commute. But if you ask us, why do we cycle? We don't cycle because we are greener than anybody else. And believe me, we are not more active than anybody else. We are as lazy as you are. We are that because humans are lazy. I mean, human beings want to get as fast, as easy around as we, all, as we can. And when the city asks Copenhagen, why did you cycle today? Then these are the answers they, the city gets. A little more than 50% say it's because it's the easiest and fastest choice. 7% down there actually said they, they did it because they thought about the environment. I have the feeling that those 7% thought that that was the answer the city was looking for and therefore were kind to the interviewer. But regardless, 7% said that. 40%, of course, still acknowledge that it's good for the exercise. I mean, I don't know how many of you who actually own a gym subscription, and if you use it, how many of you who, ride, who drive a car down to the gym? My, imagine, my imagination is that it would be quite a lot who would do so. Well, instead of paying for that gym subscription and for the car to go there, you could just ride your bike around town in the morning, and then you would immediately get the exercise. And, well, some of us could probably use a little more of that, but still. That uh, is still, of course, a consideration for a lot of people. But Copenhagen, we weren't always Copenhagen. This is uh, central Copenhagen a few decades ago. This is one of the most historical places. This over there is actually the old execution place where they used to chop off heads of uh, criminal offenders. This is an old 400-year fountain that the king, king erected for his coronation. So a really historical part of uh, central Copenhagen. And this is what it looked like in the late 1950s. Cars, cars, and cars. No space for anything else. This is what it looks like today, where the cars have been removed, at least most of the car parking has been removed. Now there is space enough for a Swedish bur vegan burger chain, uh, some small commercials, a lot of young people drinking beer uh, or wine. Yes, you can do that in Denmark out in public. Nobody cares. Um, here around the fountain, and so on. But notice one thing. On this picture and on this picture, there are exactly the same amount of parked vehicles. The only difference is that now it's bicycles. And that means that the city now has space enough for all the other activities that constitutes a city, not just cars. Because when the bicycle is being parked, it takes up so less so much less space than a car, that it leaves space for so many other activities. We could also show another, some other pictures just so you know where Copenhagen comes from. This is one of the, leading, uh, one of the arteries leading into central Copenhagen in 1988, three, uh, 30 years ago. Well, there is a bicyclist, a uh, poor woman, being uh, squeezed there behind the van. And basically, no bike lanes, uh, very little space for the pedestrians. You could also take this street I actually live right there uh, today. Uh, well, this is what it looked like in 1964 before our trams were taken away and replaced by diesel buses. Biggest mistake of the 1960s in Denmark. Um, but this is what it looked like. You won't find any bike lanes. Or you can take this square, uh, Israel Square in central Copenhagen. That, that's what it looked like in uh, late 50s and 60s. And this is what it looks like today. Now it's actually a school playground. 
Uh, we have big market hall to the right of this picture. A lot of people just hanging out and actually spending time with each other. Suddenly we have people meeting each other instead of just parking their vehicles there. Or we can take this picture. This is Norbrogade. This is one of the central uh, streets in Copenhagen leading into the, the city center itself. The city center is up here. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1977. That, I was like a small kid at that point. And you can be very sure that my mom would never allow me to ride a bicycle on this street. We lived in this neighborhood, so I, I actually know it quite well. No bicycle tracks at all. Uh, you have two car lanes, which with Danish traffic culture means that you can easily squeeze in three cars often uh, because we are really bad in traffic. And then very little space for the uh, pedestrians. But if you look at this bus, it's bus line five. And bus line five has had the same route through Copenhagen for 120 years, at least. That means that the city has excellent data on usage, on finances, and all, and all that stuff. And in around 2005, there was a, a person from the administration who went into the archives, and he found a bus schedule from 1905. And he brought, took a copy and brought it back to his office. He works in planning. Uh, and then he discovered that the bus schedule of 1905 was identical to the bus schedule of 2005. So 100 years of progress from horse-driven carriages to diesel buses at that time meant absolutely nothing. Imagine how expensive it is for a city to run its public transport like that. The congestion simply meant that the buses took so long time driving through the street that, of course, this was annoying for the commuters and expensive for the city. So the city had to do something, and the city council decided to close down the street, like here. Only this small, small part uh, painted the asphalt red and put up signs saying no individual cars allowed and persuaded the police to actually enforce it. The police in Denmark is not municipal, so that sometimes takes a little bit of convincing them to actually do what uh, the cities want them to do. Um, and there, and then the city started to rebuild the street. So now it looks like this. This is a picture of last year. The former picture we you saw was taken from up here, but it was easier to put up a drone uh, down at the other end, so that's what we did in Copenhagen Ice. Now we have broad promenades that you can actually walk on, really spend your time on. We have one car lane in each direction that also doubles as a bus lane. And then you have 18 feet wide bike lanes in each direction. Let me repeat that. 18 feet wide bike lanes in each direction curb protected so that cars don't accidentally swerve onto the bike lane. And this total change of the street cost the city just around $6 million to, uh, to implement. Uh, that was it, $6 million. Uh, and then uh, the, the transformation of the street uh, took place here. The result, well, today, uh, when, when the whole uh, transformation started, there was 81,000 people being transported on the street. Now the numbers are 97,000. Of course, the number of cars went down 60%. The number of bicycles also went up. I mean, when you have 18 feet to your disposal, then it's actually wide enough to have two cargo bikes next to each other chatting, and then you can still have all the fast bicyclists on the left overtaking them. So that means good conditions for the bicyclists. A little disappointing, only 5% more people in the buses. But those 5% paying the full ticket price, as well as now, for the first time in more than 100 years, the buses are driving faster through this street, means that the $6 million that the city spent on this has already been paid back. Uh, sorry, has already been paid back. Because when you have a more efficient public transport, then you don't need as many buses to actually uh, carry out the service. That, again, means less costs for the city. Together, couple that with more passenger revenue, that's a pure win-win situation. 
So the city can, can now spend those, mil, those mil money uh, every year on better public transport in other parts of the city. Uh, or you can choose lower taxes. That's, of course, a political question for the local city council. This just shows that it's actually a really good business case for making a more efficient public transport and better for the commuters. Uh, it only pays back. But it was, it, what is interesting here are actually two side effects that we definitely didn't expect. One of the side effects is 165% more pedestrians. That means people who just now walk through the street. And who are they? Well, a lot of these are actually older people who suddenly feel safe in traffic and thereby take part in the everyday activities of the local neighborhood. Huge advantage, for, of course, for everybody that you have, uh, you, we bridge this generational gap and can have the elderly people feeling safe again out in traffic. That's nice. But it's also kids. Parents sending their kids off to school on their own. They don't have to be followed. They don't have to be driven to school in a car. They can, they can actually do it themselves. That also means that the kids feel more independent early on. That's beneficial to everybody. So having 165% more pedestrians was a very interesting side effect. But the most radical side effect was this one. 15 times as many people are now just hanging out, sitting on the bridge, for instance, as you saw before, enjoying life, sitting there even with barbecues on a Sunday and on a summer night, or with a bottle of wine, just enjoying life, meeting friends, using the street and using the urban space for what it's actually supposed to be used for, human activities. Not just traffic, but actually human activities. But that was unexpected, especially that kind of development was totally unexpected for the city council. So this is what a morning rush hour looks like. You see a lot of people on the bike lane, you see a few cars, and that's just about it. What's key part of Copenhagen is these four uh, principles, that the, whenever we build, it's people-centered, it's transparent, it's intuitive, and it's connected. It doesn't really help anybody if you build bike lanes or whatever you want to build, and you do it a little here, a little there, something down here. I mean, who would ever use that? It's still unsafe to use. So it, things need to be connected. It also needs to be intuitive. And an intuitive street is a street where you don't have to look for all the signs, but you immediately know how you should behave when you are out there. I must admit that there are two countries in the world where I am not that fond of, of driving. It's Germany and it's the US. You have a million signs everywhere. And it may just be me, but I get confused. And I spend, end up spending more time looking for all the signs than I actually do looking at traffic and knowing how to position myself. And that's a clear sign for me that this isn't intuitive because then I wouldn't need all the signs. Then I would know how to behave. And that is how we should build our cities. And when we start doing that, then we can actually create much better streets where we can also focus on uh, traffic safety. Because traffic actually kills a lot of people every single year, and they don't need to die. We could actually work towards a vision zero for all of uh, our cities, and thereby actually get to a situation where people wouldn't get killed or maimed in traffic. It's not that uh, unrealistic, and it isn't that unreasonable a demand, actually. But in Copenhagen, we have four different types of infrastructure, and that's all. When the speeds are really low, then it looks like this, shared space. So even though the cars can still go here, then you can see by the tricycle that, okay, they're not the focus. Uh, priority are def def definitely on other modes of transport. Uh, when the paint, uh, when, sorry, when the speed goes a little up, then it might look like this. We have a painted lane. But in general, I would say that a paint is the lazy planner and lazy politician's way of saying, I don't care. That's rude. I know that. I'm sorry if there are any politicians or planners present. Uh, but I actually mean it. If you start doing only, if you only want to do paint, then it's a way to say that you don't prioritize safety. And especially if you do the paint on the door side, the driver door side of the car, because that's the way where you actually let the bicyclist be hit by a door that is being opened and then you end out under a truck. 
and ending up under a truck is unhealthy. Uh, so that's not recommendable. Uh, if you ever are going to do paint, then it has to be on the curb side because that's a little more safe, at least when we can get the drivers to not park there. So we only have a few miles of that in Copenhagen because the drivers have a tendency to using a painted bike lane as a new way of parking and as a very easy way of parking. And they do that in Copenhagen just like they do that in the rest of the world. So the main infrastructure uh, is this one in Copenhagen, the curb-separated bicycle track. Here we have three layers of the road. We have the car lane, we have the bike lane that is separated, in this case by a curb. There are many ways of doing it. Uh, Copenhagen historically uses granite curbs, pretty expensive solution, you don't have to do that. Uh, I know Bogota in Colombia, their uh, capital ordered 500 kilometers, 310 miles of concrete slabs from the local cement factory and actually used that to separate the bicycle tracks from uh, the car lanes. That's a pretty efficient way because no car would like to run into uh, a concrete slab of this height uh, just by accident. That's danger, uh, the, That's pretty annoying to the uh, whole side of the car as well as to the tires. You don't want to do that. That's also a bit of radical way of separation. Uh, less is possible. Um, but this separation means that the cars won't accidentally swerve onto the bike lane. But we also need a separation for the, the, to the sidewalk. In this case, another curb. And that's because we don't want the bicyclist to be on the sidewalk, because that's a place for the pedestrians. And if we mix the pedestrians and the bicyclists, then we can be very sure that kids won't feel safe, elderly people won't feel safe, people with a disability won't feel safe, and why on earth would we create a city where those three types of people feel unsafe? That's unfair. So we need to separate them as well in order to really get the traffic flowing as much as possible. This is the key part of what a Copenhagen street looks like, and it has proven to actually work. When the speeds go up, this is a highway leading into Copenhagen, then we are talking different kind of separation. In this case, a buffered bicycle track where you have some greenery, you have a fence, and still here at 7.30 in the morning when this picture was taken, people can feel safe riding their bike into town even though it's uh, next to a highway. So that's the fourth type. And we only have those four, meaning that it's very easy for people to get around. And if you have noticed, no, there are no bicycle helmets. And no, there are no high-vis clothing or anything because they are not needed when you have a safe city. They are not needed when you have a safe infrastructure. And uh, all the calls that there are for mandatory bicycle helmets and so on, or even recommended bicycle helmets, that's, an e that's the uh, worst way of deflecting uh, the focus of where it should be, N namely a demand for our politicians to create safe infrastructure for us so we don't need all that. Uh, we can get back to that. I'm sure you have questions on, on uh, bicycle helmets and all that, but we don't use them. Just as you won't see them in the Netherlands, they don't need them either because the infrastructure is safe. Of course, we are also talking about new bridges. Copenhagen is a city that's divided by a harbor. Uh, and a good story is this Borgeborn Bridge that you see here. It's actually the first bridge that was built in the city over the harbor for a little more than 200 years. It was inaugurated in 2006. And when it was inaugurated, the city planners thought that it would be actually only used by around 3,000 bicycle riders a day. The moment it opened, the numbers were 9,000. A third of them were car drivers who uh, sold the car and started using a bicycle. Uh, then the numbers started growing. And when it reached 12, 14,000, then they started complaining. Because at this time, this orange thing wasn't here. So the bicycle riders had to uh, take the bike here along the mall and then lift it up on these uh, set of stairs. And uh, they thought, thought that was annoying and time consuming. So they started demanding a good infrastructure. So the city started building this one, the bike snake, as it's called today. In Danish, that's a play of word on the tube inside the tire and, of course, the bicycle. But that, let's leave that. I don't expect it to be fluent in Danish. Not yet. Um, but this orange bridge then, 230 meters, uh, was that an eighth of a mile? 
was uh, then built for the bicycle riders to avoid them having to lift up their bicycles. That means that the numbers exploded. Then today we have 24,000 bicycle riders a day using this set of infrastructure in Copenhagen, meaning that actually still, according to surveys, a third of them are car drivers who left their car behind and started using a bicycle. That just shows that whatever we build will immediately be used. If you build it, they'll come. That goes for highways and it goes for bicycle tracks. The only difference is the price that the bicycle infrastructure is so much cheaper than car infrastructure that it actually saves a lot of tax money. Um, it's also about, the, this is a little more quirky, but uh, this micro infrastructure, the tilted garbage can, is sort of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of Copenhagen. The story behind it is actually pure efficiency. The st a street sweeper was so tired of having to clear the area around all the garbage cans because the bicycle riders couldn't hit the, the garbage can. And them being lazy, as we all are, no bicycle rider ever uh, left their bike, went down and picked up the garbage and put it into the bicycle, uh, sorry, into the garbage can. So when he, one day he came back to the workshop, he uh, cut a, a, off a, one of the uh, garbage cans and tilted it and went to his boss and said, can we try this out? The boss looked at it and said, okay, let's do that. Uh, they made three of them in some of the most used spaces. And suddenly, the street cleaners found out that, oh, now the bicycle riders could actually hit, hit the garbage can. So a lot more efficient street cleaning was the result. And I hope he got the biggest pay raise in Copenhagen that year because he definitely deserved it. Probably he didn't, unfortunately, but I would hope so. So this is actually what Copenhagen looks like on a, on a winter day. Uh, still, you see the city being uh, filled up with bicycles. It's quite congested. A lot of people also use the, the cargo bikes. One in four families in Copenhagen use cargo bikes instead of a car uh, to get their kids to kindergarten. In this case, well, four kids being brought down to the local kindergarten. It can also be uh, transporting your friends around uh, on a cargo bike or your furniture. I mean... We do have IKEAs in uh, Copenhagen, and actually IKEA is opening the world's first bike here in a couple of years' time in central Copenhagen. IKEA come to, came to me when I was mayor and asked for a planning permit to build up an IKEA in the middle of the city. You can imagine the loudness of the no they got. Uh, afterwards, I said, but you've misunderstood. We don't want any parking. Hmm? I listened. We want bike parking. And we want space enough for 150 cargo bikes so that people can borrow a cargo bike and bring home the furniture after they bought it. I listened. And at the end, I was like, cool, let's go for that. Let's ask city council if they would agree for that. They did. And IKEA is hoping to, bring, uh, to open, as I said, the world's first bike here so you can bring, take back your furniture on a cargo bike. But, I mean, cargo bikes can be used a lot for a lot of things from the cradle, or in this case, a little four before the cradle, and of course, to the grave. In this case, uh, this hearse was uh, designed by, uh, by this lady, who is actually CEO of uh, a company called The Funeral Ladies in, uh, in Copenhagen. And she has specialized now, she has two hearses built like that. She has specialized in um, making your final transport uh, uh, on a bicycle because, as most Copenhageners would say, why on earth would I, would I be in a car for my lab final transport? I don't have a driver's license. I've never, I've never used a car. Why on earth wouldn't I be on a bicycle uh, on my final day? And I've told my family, I don't care what kind of ceremony they're going to get as long as they ask her to be in the front of uh, my hearse uh, on my final day, that's for sure. So you can use a cargo bike for a lot, and this is just one of the examples. Now, you may ask yourself, how expensive is this? And uh, if we take the total investment over the last 16 years in Copenhagen, we are talking 320 million euro, uh, dollars. That goes for, and I'm sorry this is in kilometers and I didn't convert it to miles, but we are talking just around uh, 320 miles of, of uh, dedicated infrastructure. That can be the cycle tracks, it can be cy green cycle routes, or it can be the supercycle highways that leads into the suburbs. And we're talking more than 10 new bridges over the harbor. 
320 million dollars for that. You could also, for those 320 millions, which also was actually paid, get two miles of a car bypass tunnel north of Copenhagen. So 320 miles of bicycle infrastructure that makes the city look like this grid, this network you see up there, or a two-mile car bypass tunnel. Which would you choose? Well, the choice is yours. But I know what I would like to choose as a taxpayer. And this actually just shows that the bicycle infrastructure is so much cheaper, but it's always being discussed. Always you'll find mayors saying, oh, we can't afford that. And when I got that question when I was mayor from my colleagues, when they asked me, how on earth have you in Copenhagen been able to afford it? Then my reply was always, well, I don't know. We don't have a lot of money, so we have to choose the cheapest infrastructure. How have you been able to afford not doing this? You must have a lot, of, a lot of money, since you can just build highways around your whole city. We didn't have the money for that in Copenhagen. Uh, and that question, I think we should start asking our politicians and planners. Why on earth are they always choosing the most expensive piece of infrastructure and not the most efficient? So, and when we talk about finances, well, this is not actually my calculations, but this is one kilometer, 0 0.6 miles of extra traffic in... Uh, that you can choose on a car or on a bike. If you write that, then you actually gain society 68 cents. If you choose to do the same distance in a car, then you cost society 78 cents. Societal economics is always a bit fluffy. Uh, the the, equa the uh, calculations here is actually done by the Danish Ministry of, uh, of Finance, not the city of Copenhagen and not me, I don't know how to do them, or Copenhagenize. I think we would be biased. Um, but this, the reason behind this is, again, cheaper infrastructure. We can save a lot of money. But it's also about the consequences. Because uh, a population that rides bikes are less obese. And by less obesity, we also have less people with diabetes, less people with cardiovascular diseases, and the list just goes on and on. And regardless of whether you have a state-driven health care or privately financed health care, well, the costs are still there for all of us. We still need to finance the health care. And uh, when you start calculating all this together, then this is the difference. $1.44 for each kilometer. That's a lot of money that you can actually save by people riding a bike instead of driving a car. But in general, this is about the city. This is not about the bicycle. It's about creating better cities. And a city where, in this case, a father has no problem taking his daughter in a princess dress on her way to kindergarten or preschool. And, uh, of course, she's on her own bike. She can be uh, independent, get around town, and feel that she's out there in traffic as well. This is about creating better cities, not about anything else. And that's, of course, the most important thing. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the, the great talk. Um, I'm cu curious about this example of IKEA. It sounds like they were kind of proactive in being more bicycle centric. Does your firm work with, with corporations at, at all about kind of fostering this mentality? Uh, we do. There are a lot of uh, corporations uh, around the world who've seen uh, that the future is uh, not about individual cars, but actually about either shared cars or changing into active and green mobility. And some of those uh, are also developers who, for instance, have noticed that housing becomes so much more expensive when you have to build parking garages and therefore are seeking to find other kinds of alternatives. And actually, it was interesting uh, for me in my previous life to see that a lot of the housing developers of Copenhagen were actively trying to persuade the city council to remove parking uh, and actually go into more bicycle, more bicycle parking, more better bicycle facilities, because they said, well, it can, we can actually therefore uh, thereby uh, lower the rent uh, and thereby create better and more affordable housing. 
And a lot of uh, developers also here in the US have seen that now and are starting, and they, are, they have called us, for instance, so we work together with them. Uh, we do that in Ohio. We do that uh, also uh, in North Carolina. There are some who are really interested in, uh, in uh, going that direction. Uh, thank, uh, thank, first off, thank you for this talk, but where do we create or get the political capital to start uh, doing this over here in the United States since we're so entrenched with the idea of the automobile and the personal independent autonomy and et cetera? If there is one thing a politician, and here I'm really generalizing, if there is one thing a politician is afraid of, it's not being reelected. So in Copenhagen, the same thing happened. This was not a top-down approach in Copenhagen. This was Copenhageners who were fed up with the city being used as parking lots. And parents weren't able to send their kids off to school. And they started demonstrating. They started manifesting that they wanted change. At one point, we actually had a third of Copenhagen's population in front of the city hall saying, enough is enough, we want change. And that, of course, created a situation where politicians and planners started thinking, okay, what could we do differently? And at the same time, Copenhagen didn't have a lot of money, uh, really was in a bad financial situation, and thereby had to choose, as I said, the cheapest possible infrastructure. So those things connected. And I think, I mean, that's where one of the issues where uh, choosing the right infrastructure is not just a green thing, is a... Uh, you don't have to be a long-haired tree, hugging liberal or left-wing like me, uh, but you can actually vote for efficiency and using the taxpayer money as, as nice as possible, uh, and we still want the same thing. And that's safe and protected bicycle infrastructure because that's cheapest. And I think it's starting that movement. And then, of course, because we can do... We can spend millions and millions on campaigns saying it's the best thing to ride your bicycle. But who on earth would send their kids out on the bicycle if you know they're going to get killed? That's very few parents who do that. Uh, so we need the safe and protected infrastructure. But I can promise you I have never seen a city that had started building that infrastructure where it didn't get used from the second it was inaugurated. But the, the movement has to come from uh, all of us as citizens. The demands have to come there. We have to stand up and, de and actually demand that we can live in cities that are human scale. Thank you. Uh, how is Copenhagen handling the uh, coming of the advent of electric scooters? Yeah, uh, badly, I think is the short answer to that question. The city in, uh, of Copenhagen has, uh, together with other municipalities, uh, asked for legislative possibilities to actually regulate. Uh, we have seen in Barcelona, in Paris, in London, that they have used their powers to actively regulate the scooters uh, in a way that we can actually keep to safety again. Because we know that uh, we are now, for, uh, for real, starting to see deaths in our cities with uh, people using a scooter to get around, and they are unsafe. At the same time, they are environmentally catastrophic. Uh, the way they are built is often, I think, the average lifespan of a lot of the scooters that uh, are on the streets now is just about three to four weeks. Three to four weeks we are talking about that. So uh, that is environmental disastrous. So uh, Copenhagen has asked for regulative powers. The uh, national government in Denmark uh, gave the city the power to uh, regulate. Copenhagen took it immediately until the city realized that parliament had forgotten the right to enforce the regulation. And I'm not kidding. In law, by law, Copenhagen has the right to regulate but not the right to enforce the regulation. Uh, the national government said, oops, sorry, let's look at that in 2020. So we are waiting. Uh, which means that we have, I think, eight or nine com scooter companies now in Copenhagen, totally unregulated. Means that a lot of uh, people, especially in wheelchairs, 
can't get out of their homes and can't get around the city because they will run into a scooter whenever they get around. Uh, I think easily I can say that uh, most Copenhageners feel that there is a special place in hell reserved for the inventor of the scooter. Um, and it's a very hot place. Uh, so, but, but we all hope for the regulation in January. The government has promised us that. So, but so far, badly. We need to regulate it uh, as we need to regulate most other types of traffic. It's not out there that I don't like scooters. Um, I think that mo it, it can be great also, you can say, for transport between cities uh, and towns. But of course, it needs to be regulated. Needs to be, we have to need to have some, some pretty clear and transparent rules for that. Um, but it takes time. So thank you again. Um, a question that kind of be answered one or two ways. What kind of population densities is Copenhagen having versus, say, American cities? Or another way around, what, what's the kind of average path length of travel by a bicycle for people traveling 100 miles a day, two blocks? Um, the average, you can say the city of Copenhagen is a dense city. We are talking 620,000 people on 25 square, uh, square miles. So that's very dense. The moment you get outside the city and into Greater Copenhagen, the density more rapidly um, looks more and more like American cities, I would say. Only when you get 10, 12 miles away from the city center of Copenhagen, then you have sprawl. Um, and of course, the numbers of people on a bicycle fall when, uh, you, get, when you get out there. Then there's no doubt about it. Um, the average, you can say Copenhagen is just around, the city of Copenhagen itself is around eight, nine miles from north to south within the city borders. Um, the average length uh, where the, the, the bike is the normal mode of transport would be up to four or five miles. Uh, the city is pushing that limit more and more now, together with all the suburbs, to try to get it up to 8 to 10 miles. Uh, that's the number that you see in the Netherlands. There, the, the uh, bike is the main mode of transport up to just around 9, 10 miles. Uh, beyond that, then the car or public transport really takes over. Uh, but I think it's possible, also with the advent of the e-bike, the electric-assisted bike, where you still have to pedal, you still have to do some work, but uh, you get this push that, that means that you can go up to 16, 18 miles an hour. Um, but with that, then it's no deal at all to commute uh, 15 miles, uh, 10, 15 miles uh, to work every single day and back. Uh, we see people doing that on an electric assisted bike, as long as the infrastructure is there. Um, I have a question about China. So that the share bike economy has actually reshaped many Chinese cities now, and then it does raise the interest of using bicycles, and also, but created a huge waste of the broken bikes. Mm. Uh, so I want to hear about your opinion of this kind of different situation. I uh, had a slide that I removed that actually showed a bicycle graveyard in Hangzhou. Um, which is an awesome picture. I can only recommend to Google it uh, because that shows uh, the sharing situation if you don't regulate. And I noted that uh, I was in Beijing last week and I've noticed now that the cities in China now for, really have, for real have started regulating the, uh, the, the shared bike and that I think is the, the good way to move forward because... Um, the sharing economy is great, and can you get people to not necessarily need to buy a bicycle, but actually share it, only use it for the ride? But you do it in a way where you know where the where the bikes are being parked, you know where you can find it, and so on. Then you can actually still get um, the condition of being able to move around the city quite easily. Uh, the first couple of years in China, I th my experience was that they forgot the regulation, and so everything was chaos. Uh, but there is no doubt that when in all our cities, when we see bike share programs, we see a rise in people using a bicycle instead of using a car. That's great. Uh, I'm totally in favor of that. There are many ways of doing it. We know the old tradition way is the, is the docked bike share system. The advantage of that is that you always know where you can find a bicycle. And if, especially if we are talking electric-assisted bike share bikes, then... 
uh, they can also be charged at the same time. So that has an advantage compared to the Douglas bikes. I think one or two more, two more questions is what we can get. Please. I'm curious to hear more about how you guys designed the transportation infrastructure in lieu with other aspects of urban planning, let's say housing project, because a lot of the project you showed is basically um, dealing with concerns and comments from the bike list from that specific period. And I'm curious to know how in the, in the long-term period you guys think about that in terms of the whole role of urban planning in Denmark and Copenhagen, yeah. The reason why I focus on streets and street infrastructure is because I actually think that that is the main interest and that is the key part of how we develop our, our cities. We can uh, talk a lot about how we build our buildings and where we build our housing. Obviously, when you, whenever you build residential, you need to have enough uh, covered par bike parking so that uh, during snow or during heavy storms or whatever, then the uh, bikes are being uh, protected and you can still use it. Uh, but for me, the key part of creating a, a connected, a good city is actually the streets and is the transport uh, modes. And therefore, we focus, all in Copenhagen, I, I focus on the streets, on the street infrastructure, because that is the key way uh, of looking to how can we create a good human skills uh, uh, cities. Uh, then the architects can design some nice buildings afterwards. And I have a lot of opinions on what, what is good architecture, but uh, my main focus is transport. Well, on that note, uh, join me in, in thanking you. Thank you.